Hello and welcome back to Handheld Computing. I'm pleased to say that we're rapidly heading towards a thousand subscribers. So a big thank you to everyone who's subscribed so far. And if you haven't subscribed already, please do as I am trying to grow the channel. So today we're having a look at putting new cells into a battery pack for an HP Janata J6 or J7 series. As some of you will know from watching my channel, I use a Janata 728 most days for organisational tasks, but also for writing scripts for the channel and jotting down ideas, that kind of thing. But since production finished 20 years ago, the batteries are a little bit long in the tooth. Luckily, the battery pack is made up of two 18650s, which have been popularised by vaping, so replacements are readily available. Thankfully, the battery management system, or BMS, is also very simple, so there's no need to be rewriting EEPROMs or anything like that, unlike with some later smart batteries from Sony and the like. Although this video is specific to the Janata, the same principles will apply to many other devices from this period. Before we get started, a word of warning, lithium ion cells pack a high energy density, so short circuits, exposure to high temperatures or damage to the battery can cause uncontrolled thermal events. In addition, when lithium burns, it produces highly toxic smoke, so when doing this, take every precaution and make sure Sure you have access to the outside should anything bad happen. If you're unsure what an exploding battery looks like, there's lots of videos on YouTube and I suggest you go have a look. So how much improvement in battery life can we get? The original battery pack is rated at 1500 milliamp hours and according to HP could deliver around nine hours of usage. That's nine hours of scheduling, editing documents, typing emails, perhaps listening to a few mp3s etc. It's not nine hours of the CPU running full throttle. In the last 20 years, battery technology has improved a little bit, thankfully. So it's now possible to get single cells with a rating of 3600 milliamp hours. Putting a pair of those in the battery pack gives a predicted life of 21 and a half hours, which is pretty impressive. But how long does a 20 year old battery last? I'm glad you asked. So we're going to run a stress test. So we're going to get the CPU running at 100%, put the screen on maximum brightness and have the speaker cranking out at max volume. How are we going to do this? By playing Lord of the Rings Extended Edition obviously. So let's see how far we get. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. Fool of a duke! Fly, you fools! Fly! So even at 20 years old, we still managed 2 hours and 29 minutes getting us past the elves and onto the lake. Not quite to Boromir's death scene though. I still think that's pretty good for a 20 year old battery and in real usage I'd probably get nearer 4 or 5 hours and charge the device once or possibly twice a week at most, which is pretty good going. So we're going to put some 3000 milliamp cells in which should in theory double the battery life from the original batteries and we'll see how we go. So this isn't the first time I've reselled one of these batteries. I actually did one about 8 years ago and there's a few mistakes I made along the way including just damaging this seam so I put it together with a bit of sellotape but actually it worked very well so I'm just going to open this one up and show you what I did and what I could do better. So first and foremost one of the mistakes I made was my choice of battery so these are 
cheap Chinese lithium cells rated at 3000 milliamp hours. I'll tell you, they are actually nowhere near 3000 milliamp hours, but they did work. I bought tagged cells to make it easier to solder the wires onto. It's not the tidiest job in the world, but actually it worked very well. And um, I've been using this battery, as I say, about eight years, and it still holds some charge, although not a lot. So before we move on, let's talk about batteries. So the rise in popularity of 18650s is a double-edged sword. It means that they're readily available, but it also means there's a huge market for knockoff batteries. There are literally millions of knockoff batteries available to buy. Some of those knockoffs just have exaggerated capacities, like the battery that came with my mini Spotlight, which claims to have 6,800 milliamp hours capacity. So one, that's not possible, and two, this cell does not weigh anywhere near enough to be that capacity. It's likely that it's actually a 800 milliamp hour capacity and they've simply printed a six in front of it. Some of the knockoffs are old batteries that were sent for recycling. They've been tested, rewrapped, and sold as new batteries. And some knockoff batteries are actually from genuine production lines where the battery has failed the standard. They're fished out of the bins and simply sold on by unscrupulous employees. Because of this, it's important to try and find a legitimate retailer and to be suspicious of any batteries that claim crazy capacities. Also be skeptical of any batteries that seem too cheap. If you can get three batteries for the price of one, it's quite likely that those three batteries are utter rubbish. Sadly, the use of knockoffs might not just result in a reduced capacity in your final product, but could also possibly damage your equipment or set on fire. So with this in mind, read some reviews and take care when choosing your batteries. So after reading several reviews, I went for these. So these are Frogstar batteries rated at three amp hours. And the company itself say that they test every batch of batteries that come in to make sure that they're not cheap Chinese knockoffs and you can select different wraps for them. They're designed for vaping, of course, although I didn't bother, this is their standard wrap. So they're a flat top with no protection circuit and that's ideal for what we're using as the protection circuit actually makes the batteries a little too long to fit in the casing. So next up, we need to actually get into the casing of the battery itself. So the easiest way of doing this is actually to go for the raised bit of plastic on the outside edge on both sides. So let's get on and have a look inside the casing. We just need to get a little bit of a break in the casing and I can just get my nail under this edge. And you can see it's just starting to move now as I lever it. Do the same at the other end. Once you've got the edge open, just pop a plastic tip in and run down the edge. And there we have it. Be careful not to break the uh, connector there as I nearly did. So once we're in, we can see there's the control chip there. There's a connection to the middle of the two batteries here, a connection to the negative there, and the positive is just at the end there. So next up, we want to remove the batteries. These are usually glued in. So you'll see, yeah, there's a spot of glue just there. So using a plastic spud, so as not to damage the wrap on the battery, as that can cause a short circuit, just run along that inner edge to break the glue. And on the other side. And then on the tip, just give it a quick squeeze and hey presto, the first battery is loose. And we'll do the same on the other side, making sure not to damage it, that's it. So now we've got two halves of a case with minimal damage to the actual plastics, nothing a bit of glue won't fix our cells and the control board. So the next job is to de-tag the batteries. So I'm going to attempt to reuse the same tags that they currently have. You could easily add new nickel strips if you wanted, but I'm going to try and reuse these tags. 
So again, a couple of cautions with this. You don't want to damage any of the sleeve and you certainly don't want to cause a short circuit. I'm gonna start with a negative pull as you can't really short circuit that. So we're just gonna ease that up and using some pliers, we're just gonna gently ease the tag up. Like so. Next, we'll do the positive. So just check that it's well insulated all the way around before you put your metal pliers in there. And we're gonna do the same thing. Lovely. Before we go any further, I'm just gonna mark those two so that I know what they are. So this is the negative and this one is the positive. The last thing you want to do is rewire it incorrectly. So let's remove the other two tags. And there we have it, two separated batteries ready to be recycled. So before we go connecting these batteries up, let's have a talk about the different methods you can use. So we now need to attach the new batteries to the tags. There's a few options for doing this. The first is soldering. This will work and will provide a good connection. The only issue with soldering the batteries is that the high temperatures produced by the soldering iron can damage the battery itself, reducing its capacity or possibly even damaging it. So if soldering is the preferred option for yourself, I would suggest that you get tagged batteries. This means that you can put a heat sink between the soldering soldering iron and the battery itself on the tag, reducing the risk of thermal damage. I have heard of people simply wedging the batteries back in using bits of tinfoil or springs to try and maintain connections. And while this might work, it does mean that any knocks or bumps could easily disconnect the battery losing data or possibly even result in a short circuit. So I definitely wouldn't recommend this. On some of the forums, I've seen people suggest the use of cold solder. I've never used this, so I don't know how well it works, but I don't see why it wouldn't. For myself, I've chosen to buy a mini spot welder. This is partly because I have a fair few devices where the batteries would benefit from being replaced. The spot welder itself is a bit fiddly to use, but actually very effective. I'm not saying it's the best one out there, it's the one that I've used and I'll put a link below. So let's crack on and do a bit of spot welding. So before I do that, I'm just going to straighten out all the nickel tags. I'm also just gonna remove this little bit of gunge and from this one as well. And I'm just gonna clean this off with a little bit of alcohol. Great, so now we're ready to spot weld our batteries. I'm gonna start with this end. Once you've got one connection, it's best to do another. Make sure it feels nice and solid. That feels good. And then let's do the other end. Lovely. So that's one battery in. Let's do the other. So I'm just going to check the voltage between the two cells. 6.99, so that looks good. Next up, let's reassemble the battery pack. First of all, let's get it all lined up with the case. We want to secure the batteries so that they don't move. So for that, I'm gonna use a couple of these foam tags. And this will prevent the batteries moving when they get knocked or jostled and therefore stop them from breaking connection. You could also use a bit of glue from a glue gun and that feels nice and secure. Let's make sure the other casing fits. It does, it pops on quite nicely. Looks like I did a better job this time. So next up, I'm just gonna run a little bit of glue around the edge. Try not to glue your fingers together. Once you've got the case fitting all the way around, we just need to hold it shut. So I'm gonna use some sellotape. Great, that'll do. We'll come back in 10 minutes and see how we're doing. Once all that's done and you've removed all the sellotape, it's time to put the battery back in the Janada. At this point, because the batteries have been disconnected and reconnected, you need to reboot the BMS. This is done by removing all the batteries from the Janada, putting the battery in, and then connecting it to a power source. If you try plugging the battery straight in while your Janada's on power, 
All that happens is the BMS doesn't get rebooted, so the battery can't charge or discharge in this situation. The result being, if you remove the power lead, you lose all your data. So this is why it's so important to do a backup before you start. Once that's done, fully charge your battery, and then I would recommend doing a couple of cycles of charge and discharge. So the new batteries actually managed seven hours and 28 minutes of stress test. So this took us well past the Battle of Helm's Deep and into the Return of the King. We got to see Legolas drink Gimli under the table, and we saw the amazing monologue by Smeagol slash Gollum. So seven hours and 28 minutes wouldn't be very impressive if this was a normal test, but it's not. This is the absolute minimum amount of time that you will be able to spend on your device. So actually, that's quite impressive. I regularly use WR Tools ResInfo, which gives me a battery life meter. So I'll update the description with some real world numbers once I've got some data. In the meantime, I would expect I will get somewhere between 15 and 17 hours usage under normal loads. Perhaps you've already reselled the batteries on your Janata or other palm top, or perhaps this video has inspired you to do so. Either way, pop a comment below. I'd love to know what batteries you've used, how long they've lasted, how easy you've found the process, and whether there's anything I could have done better. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And once again, thank you to everyone who's subscribed so far. We're not far from a thousand subs. My name's Hugh. This is Handheld Computing. Thanks for watching.